quick line. Brother Harold that starts it out as we worship through our giving. Father, may the giving of blessings not a burden, as in the flat new moon, and I today we are poor down and down. Make each one of us grateful in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rebel. All right, Brother John Aker.
Today's your birthday. I don't have to tell you that. Oh, let's say happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. It's got to go. The word has got to go. So that's, that's why there's so many that, that God has it, that's able to do what he does. And I thank God for them. So I've always said that. That's why it, it's got to happen that way. And I thank God it does. Week number 71. Flying through. Week 71. I enjoyed it last week. I got to sit back and watch it. Listen on the headphones. Yeah, yeah, I see what it looks like. And we're going to finish chapter 16 tonight, verses 17 through 21. We'll wrap up this chapter. And as I told you last week, this is, again, where we're having, we call it an interlude or a parenthetical. It's interesting that, that between the 6th and 7th of everything, between the 6th and 7th seal, we had an interlude. Between the 6th and 7th trumpet, we had an interlude. And now between the 6th and 7th gulf. We, we're having an interlude. And it kind of just keeps us just like a review of what's going to happen after this bowl is, is poured out or, or after this happens, just like it did all the, way, all the way through. But the thing is, this is the last seventh thing. There, there's nothing after this. It's just the fact that once this happens, we've got an interlude of what's going to happen in detail throughout the rest of the book. So we'll look at verses 17 through 21. And we'll go back and we'll break them down and look at them. So verse 17, John writes, Then the seventh angel, he poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And a great and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away. And the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. 
we, we have come in the description here to, to the end of the great tribulation with the seventh, seventh bowl being poured out. Father, we thank you again tonight for those who are able to be with us here in the sanctuary and all those who are tuned in on Facebook and those who may pull this up later on YouTube or something and watch it. We thank you, Lord, that your word goes forth. So I pray now as we endeavor to see that which you want us to know as, as disciples and as a church, that it might draw us closer to you and that it might make us better evangelists so that we understand, Lord, that this is going to be something that really happens in the future. And it may not be that far off. So just guide us and direct us and help us as we study the, these words tonight. In your name, Jesus, we say it by faith. Amen. And all his children would say, we love the Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. I'm going to drink again. 75 mm. pounds. 75 pounds. 100 pounds, 75 pounds, 50 pounds. I read it depends on which area it was in. The, the weights vary. So it could have been anywhere from 75 to 100 pounds. Of, but you know, a five pound hailstone would hurt. Yeah. So that's a, that's a heavy weight. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to stick with, with your notes here to get us, to get us through this. Uh, and, and you'll see mercy's now being replaced with the wrath of God or, or the anger. Wrath and anger is the same word. And the time of the dispensation of grace has, has ended, and we know that. We, we understood that because we're in the end of the great tribulation. And God fulfills his word in both mercy and judgment. We know that. We've learned that. So anyway, this is the final bowl. And this describes the last things to happen just before Christ returns at the end of the great tribulation. This is, this is about the last thing that's going to happen before he comes and establishes the millennial kingdom. And a lot of stuff has already happened. So now we're just getting, uh, we're getting a preview of what we're going to see as we go through the next two or three chapters. So let's look at the verses together. 17 and 18. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne. Who's on the throne? Jesus. Yeah, he, he's at the right hand of the Father, isn't he? Yeah, he's there. From the throne, saying, It is done. And 18 said, And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. This is the last of the greatest earthquake it's going to be. There's earth, you know, I read there's earthquakes somewhere probably every day. And because of all that's going on in the news, they don't report all of them, but there was a big one in New Zealand that just this past week, and I don't know if it, yeah, I mean, it killed or anything, you just get a little clip or a headline. But this one is going to be the mother of all earthquakes. It's going to be the great many earthquake of earthquakes that's going to happen at the end of the great tribulation. When he says the angel poured the bowl into the air, uh, you notice it's not the word heavens. I thought that was interesting. When I went back and, and did a word study on this when I did Revelation the first time. Because that, that word air really indicates space. Space. We forget about space. We, we, we think about the earth as, as being all that there is. My goodness, how big is this universe? How many planets are out here? <clears throat> so when this wrath is poured out in, into space, it really is really saying that this wrath, this is being poured out, is going to cover the globe. If you can picture the earth, you've seen a picture of the earth when it's in, in space. If you can just picture this, this, this wrath being poured out on the whole globe. When, when he pours it out, it's going to cover the whole earth. It's not just one area, but it's the whole earth at that time. So that's what, that's what it means. 
Now, we know who the voice is. No doubt, the voice is Christ, right? Because we saw that at the very beginning in, in chapter 4 when John said, Then the voice said, Come up here. He saw the throne and him who sat on it. So we know that that's got to be Christ. That's not an angel that's saying that. And the voice said what? The voice said, it is done. It's done. When the bowl was poured out, Christ said, it is done. Now, he has said that again somewhere else. On the cross. On the cross. Exactly, J.P. On the cross. What did he say on the cross just it before he died? It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Done. done and finished. It is finished. On the cross, the plan of salvation was finished. Wasn't it? The plan to save people was finished. That, that's what the cross was for. That's why he died. That's why he came. He came. He obeyed the Father. He did what the plan of the Father was so that all of us could be saved. And when he was put on the cross and when his life was going out of him, he said, it is finished. Because he knew when he died, our sins would be paid for. So when he finished that plan, it was to save people. This plan, when he said it is finished, is punished people. That's why this is the time of dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace is now. That's why we push so hard for people to be saved now. Because there is coming a day, listen, he's not going to save anybody else. Uh, I'm sorry. Everybody will not be saved. It, it's going to happen that way. I don't believe in predestination. We've talked about that. I believe in foreknowledge. I know that God knows who it's going to be and who's not. But it doesn't mean he predestined it just because he knows it. He's an all-knowing God. But that doesn't mean he predestines it. So when he says it is done, the judgment is done. Not the salvation, but the judgment is done with the pouring out of this last, last bowl. Now, <clears throat> chapter 4 and 5 is where we, we saw that there were thunderings and lightnings at the very beginning of the tribulation. We believe that. We, we are known as pre-tribulationalists, as Pentecostals. We believe that the church will be taken out, will be taken to heaven before tribulation begins and the wrath of God comes upon the earth. In chapter 4, when Christ told John, come up here, we take that to be the calling of the church out of the world. That, that's what we believe is going to happen. And then when he did that and John got to heaven, then he saw that there were thunderings and lightnings that were coming from around the throne. Isn't it interesting that the tribulation began that way and it's going to end that way? That, that it began with the thunderings and the lightnings. And, and what did we say that that really meant? What does it really mean when, when you see the words that voices of thunderings and of lightning. What does that really what does that really tell us? That's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? It's pretty powerful. <clears throat> if, if I were in the pulpit preaching or, or Jules was up there preaching or one of you was or may have been preaching and, and you gave across this big point about Christ or you read a scripture out of the Bible and you said, this is what the Lord says and it thundered. <laughs> you read it like that. That would do something for you. <laughs> that, that, would, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? You, you know, a lot of times when it thundered, uh, they, they thought it was God talking to them. And, and really it's when God was talking to Christ at his baptism. And they heard thunder and they said, thunder? And they said, that was the Lord. When the Lord said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So that, that puts a lot that puts a lot of oomph behind that message when that happens. Now this earthquake, there we we have seen two earthquakes that have been mentioned twice before 
in the book of Revelation. Since we've been studying it, there's been two other earthquakes. Do you remember where they were? And if you do, you got a better memory than I do because I have to use notes. And if you don't, that's okay. But the first one, the first one was at the opening of the, or after the seventh seal was opened. Remember the seals? We had the seals, we had the trumpets, we had the bowls. So in the seventh seal, in chapter 8, in verse 5, you will find that there was an earthquake after that seal was opened. You can go back and read it if you want to, but that's where it's at. It's in chapter 8, you will find it in verse 5. And then the second, second time that the earth, that an earthquake was mentioned was in chapter 11, in verses 13. Anybody remember what happened in chapter 11? I'll give you a moment to turn to your notes if you got them. There's one happens at the Battle of Armageddon. They will. Yeah, there'll be another coming. And there'll be another one of the biggest. And as he said, there's more killed with that earthquake and hailstones than, than uh, they were killed with people, guns, and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. Mighty, yeah, it's. Mighty hailstorm. Absolutely. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be that God's going gonna, gonna to do this. Man, you know, man's not going to destroy himself. God, God's going to take care of doing it for us. All right, verse, verse 11, or chapter 11. Do you, do you remember what happened in chapter 11? When Christ died. He said, Chapter 11, Revelation. The witnesses. Amen. What, what did the witnesses do? They, they came and they witnessed. And then they were killed. And then they... He tooted and they scooted. That's right. Right, That's right. They were resurrected. And what happened when they were resurrected? It was a great earthquake. Great earthquake. All this stuff that happens affects the whole earth. You know, Paul told us that back in Romans. Paul said that all creation groans for, for the revealing of the sons of God, which is really for, for the redemption. It, it's not only, it's not only that, that we are going to be redeemed, but all creation is going to be redeemed. <clears throat> you know, it, it's hard for us to imagine it, especially when when you live in a beautiful part of the world like we do. And, and it's hard to imagine that the creation has actually been cursed. But it has because of sin. And that's why the earth is not user friendly. That, that's why we, you know, we take care of it, we preserve it what we can, and we should take care of our environment, and we should try to preserve what we can preserve. It's, it's the only earth we've got. And, and it's, as Brother Don Webb from down at Tree of Life told me one day, he said, it's the best world I've ever lived in. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say that. I've never lived in another world. <laughs> so it's the best world I've ever lived in. But it has been cursed as well. And we're going to see when we get through all this, there's going to be a new earth. It's not going to be the same one that you and I uh, are on now. Uh, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot of theories on that. We'll talk about it when we get there. But everything that happens affects the whole creation, not just not just the people. So did you get your answers in your notes on that? That's what the answer is. The first one is first earthquake, the first mention was after the seventh seal, chapter eight and verse five, and the next one is when the witnesses were raised, and that's chapter eleven and verse thirteen. Those are the other two that we had seen. We'll talk a little more about the one in chapter 11 here, here directly when we get to, to the end of the, of the verses. Okay, let's look at, let's look at 19. So, or I'll tell you something I thought about while I was at home relaxing. Give me a chance. I think maybe God just slowed me down and stopped slow my paper there. Do you have any questions in regards to those two verses that we just covered? Let me just keep blazing on by here. <clears throat> Do you have any questions with, with what we've covered right there? And if you do, don't be afraid to ask it. I got one. 
Yeah. And God, when Christ died on the cross and his blood touched the earth, wasn't that a great earthquake then? Oh, yeah, yeah. The rocks split to such a degree, and you don't hear this preached much, that the tombs were actually opened and people came out of the graves and went back into Jerusalem. You don't hear that very much, do you? Because that's, that's a lot of theology that, that don't get brought into that. that don't, but if you go back and read that in the Gospels, and you will see that when that happened, that people who were trying to come out of their graves, they split, the earth split, and then they went back in. And they were seen in the city. They were seen in the city. That really happened. And, and that, you know, but the theologian, that just kind of throws you a curveball. We, we, had a, we had a minister at one of the minister conferences that touched on it. He just barely touched on it a little. Because there's not a lot, there's not a lot, it, it doesn't make sense to a lot of the stuff we teach. You know, we don't have all the answers for that. But, but he says, now, now this is his personal belief, that, that Mark, you know, John Mark, or Mark, not John Mark, Mark that wrote the gospel. Uh, he gives in his account, you know, that, that when Christ was in the garden and he told those guys, and that when they said, we've been, I'm paraphrasing, we've come for Christ. And he said, I am he. And they all fell back. And he, he said, kind of sounds like if you just read it, you think they just knelt down. But they didn't just kneel down. When he said, I am, I am, it blow them back. I mean, it blew them away. That's the power. And he said, because right after that, you see this young man who was dressed in white linen, and that, that word for what he was dressed in is the same word that they used for burial cloths. Huh? So, so he, he says, this guy was buried, and he came out when all that happened because it was, it was near the tomb wasn't far from where Jesus was going to be buried. And then he was going to follow him, remember? And they tried to catch him and he ran and they caught his, they caught his grave clothes, but he ran. And, and this, he's, he's a Polish evangelist, and he said that, that he believed that was Mark. That, that's how Mark was able to give the account because he was the one that that actually happened to. Now listen, you, you can't prove that out of scripture but you can prove the fact that when that earthquake happened when Christ died on the cross, the tombs were open and the people went back into the city. So it's, earthquakes play a big part in this thing, don't they? They really do. All right, any other questions on, on those two verses? Okay. Let's look at 19 and 20. Now the great city, the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And, and like I said, when you see that word wrath, it, it's not only it's not only taking it out on, on people, but it's his anger. It, it's the anger of God that's causing this. Then, verse 20, then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. The great city, which was divided into three parts, I, I, I believe that that was Jerusalem. I believe Jerusalem is the great city. Here's why, here's why I believe that. If you turn back to chapter 11 and verse 8, I'll turn around and read it for you. In chapter 11 and verse 8, John wrote, and, and this is the witnesses, and he said, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Where was he crucified? Jerusalem. So that's why I think Jerusalem is the great city and not Babylon. And the reason I think it is Jerusalem is because he, he mentions Babylon as great too. And he does, if, it, if it would have just said the great city and you didn't have that and where it says and the nations fail and 
great Babylon was remembered before God. That's, to me, that's two different cities. So I think the great city is, is Jerusalem from, from chapter 11 and verse 8. And, and the other thing interesting here is that all nations, all the cities, and all the nations, they're going to fall, Charles. Roanoke, Alexandria, Detroit, Atlanta, Miami, Los Angeles, Idaho. <laughs> oh, listen, they're all going to, they're all going to fall because this is going to cover the whole globe. The cities of the nations fail. This is happening all over the earth. You know, we, you kind of get the idea sometimes in reading Revelation, you, you think all this is happening right there in Jerusalem, right there in the Middle East. It's the whole world. It's the whole world. <clears throat> We're going to see as we go through the rest of the book how these ten kings, how it's broken down. The world is going to be broken down into ten divisions. We'll, we'll talk about that because there's going to be ten world leaders. So, so what we got today, there's more than 10, but it's going to get to that point. And, and we'll talk about that, but it's going to cover the whole, the whole globe. So regardless of what part of the world that people may be in, they're going to be affected by all this stuff. And, and same with the beast. You think, well, those who don't make the mark of the beast are those who take the mark of the beast. That's not just in Jerusalem. That's all over the globe. That's all over the world. We, we saw, you know, when I showed you the video, the image, that image. I got a, I got a sneaking feeling it ain't going to be just one image in one part of the world. I got a sneaking feeling this image is going to pop up in a lot of places across the globe. And, and with, with this virtual stuff we got going now, they, they, they have technology now. I know you probably haven't seen it. But they have technology now that they can... They can show the, the vision of a person, like I can be preaching here or teaching here, and they actually have cameras today that can project my image onto a stage or into a classroom somewhere else. It's a virtual image. Listen, I seen that on Star Trek. So, you know, that stuff really happens. So they've actually got technology to so when, when this image, when, when the sacrifice runs the earth, it's not going to be, well, it's just happening to them over yonder. No, it, it's going to be wherever people are across the globe. The, the whole world is going to be involved in this thing. And the next two chapters, in the next two chapters, we'll deal with the great Babylon that falls. So we'll discuss about, about the great Babylon. There's a lot of there's a lot of discussion around that particular city or who that is. It, it's interesting, the great city, which I believe, which I believe is Jerusalem, was divided in three parts. Now you guys that have been to Israel, Mary and Joseph, and maybe some of this, and some, some of the others may have been there. But but kind of correct me if I'm wrong on this. There there is really three groups over there that that kind of hold those areas. And it's the Orthodox. Orthodox Jews, right? And then it's the Muslims. And then it's the Christians. Am I right on that? There's, there's three areas. And what I read about it and what I study about it is that if you go out of your area, if you're, pretty much, you're pretty much in trouble if the Christians go into the Muslim areas and the Muslims go to the Christian areas and the dome of the rock in, in it actually divided in, into the areas to where you got the Orthodox Jews and, and the rabbis, and then you got the Muslims, and then you got the Christians. Because last year, you know, there was a rabbi killed. Wasn't that last year? Because he was on the wrong side. Yeah, and, and maybe it's the maybe it's not the tone, maybe it's the church, 
You know, maybe it's the church is a separate group. Is there, there, there's, there's one area there that's divided into three parts. It may not be where the dome is. But there's one there's one church there. Well, what's one of the churches where they you know where the tomb of Jesus is? Where, where that's supposed to be there. That's over near Garden of the Sea. That's where that church is. Is it near? Well, I was thinking it was on the temple map where this church was, that it's divided into three areas. And the Orthodox Jews have a place. And the Muslims have a place, and the Christians have a place. So that in in those areas, it's near the wall. Is it? It's near Muhammad, that wall. It's near that way of the wall. Muhammad's while the Jews are there, the Ali praying. Yeah. The wall. The Muslims are blaring out their prayers over an intercom. Yeah. To try to interrupt them from praying. Yeah. So that's the area. Yeah. So when I read when I read about it being split into three different Wow, how interesting that is. And that's kind of already in place for, for that to really happen. But <clears throat> it's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. It's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to fall because there's going to be a new Jerusalem in there. We're going to see that happen. Every island and is going to flee. Every island fled, he says. Uh, every island fled away, verse 20. <clears throat> And the mountains were not found. Think about that now. Think, think about the, the Alps. Think about Mount Everest. Th think about the big mountains here in the Mount Olympus. I mean, think about the big mountains in Colorado. They're all gone. Where are they going to go? Are they going to disappear? Well, it's going to be a big earthquake. Well, I don't know. They use prayers, they flee. They flee. I got a sneaky feeling when that big earthquake hits, it's going to crack the whole globe. And I think it's all going to, I think it's all going to flow in. I do. I think it's all going to go, all the islands are going to go. Where could they possibly go? Down the drain. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of, that, that, that's kind of common sense logical to me, but maybe they will just disappear in thin air. But I think when this when this world is shaking with that earthquake, it's going to crack like an egg. I mean, all everywhere and all this stuff is going to boom. Because we're going to see it's going to be a new earth. And and not only that, but when you talk about an island, you're talking about continents. You, you know, islands not just the little bitty things. And you're talking about some continents. You can take look at Australia. You know, a whole country. All these things are going to are going to be gone. Tsunamis, no doubt, will come from the earthquake. You're right, Charles. So, <clears throat> any any questions? Verses 19 and 20 they about that go, happening. They're going to go back to when he flooded the earth the first time. And, and could be. And then the holler down there, it's going to fill back in. Will fill it's in that reversal. same hole. It's a reversal of the beginning, isn't it? It's a reversal of the beginning. No. The flood. All the, it didn't rain until the flood. Yeah. And then they, all of these vacuums somewhere, holes. Yeah. And then uh, it opens up, they go back in. It's got to be what it could very well be. They're going somewhere. They're going somewhere. So, uh, as the old saying goes, new terminology. Boy, you learn something new all the time. And uh, come up with new stuff. I, I've heard it here lately. America's circling the drain. Have you heard that? And, and it's. And, it's true. We are. The whole earth is circling the drain. The whole earth is getting ready to go down the tubes. And they ain't trying to screw it right now. That's just, that's just fact. We're reading it right here. That's, what, that's where it's at. And we're closer now than we've ever had been. True. Closer now than we've ever had been. Any questions on 19 and 20? About the islands but going away, fleeing away, the great city being Jerusalem, or the great Babylon being remembered? We'll talk about Babylon in the next couple of chapters. Any questions on that? All right, let's see. Verse 21. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone. Has your Bible got each hailstone in italics? This is a little clip here, right? If y'all remember the class I did on how we got the Bible, and if you don't, I'll, I'll remind you. 
Anytime in, in the English translations that you see the words italicized like this, they were not in the original manuscripts, but they were added in there to help clarify the whole passage. Now, that don't mean it's false teaching. That don't mean that at all. But what it means is it was added in so that it would clarify the passage of what was happening. That's everywhere you see the words in italic. That's not just one area. That's throughout all the scripture. Just, just remember that. If you read it from original manuscript, which you don't read that way anyway, it would say, Great hail from heaven fell upon men about the way of the palace. So, so the italic says one hail stone, a hail stone weighed about the weight of the talent. It's not like a, every bit of it weighed as a talent. But one single stone weighed the, the weight of a talent. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Yeah. Whew, Lord. Now, as, as Charles said, 75 pound hail stone. King James Version says 75 pounds. 75 pounds. And, and depending on <clears throat> depending on which which era that it's measured, the Greeks the Greeks say that the talent is fifty pounds, uh, and and the the latest Jewish the later Jews uh, the talent weighed a hundred pounds. So about the time that this was written, around eighteen ninety somewhere somewhere in there, in Jewish culture, talents went anywhere from seventy five. Pounds. But listen, that's neither here nor there, is it? Uh, I mean, why split a hair between a 75 pound or do you know? Look at me, that's why I said at the beginning, a five pound hailstone falling from heaven, you know, will do the damage. Then this just kind of this just kind of emphasizes how great that's going to be. How, how heavy those things are going to be. Can't imagine. Can't imagine. Now, this is not the first time that God has used hailstones to kill his enemies. It's not the first time. In Joshua chapter 10, you read about where the king of Israel got four other kings to join up with him to come against Gideon, G-I-D-E-O-N, to come against Gideon, of which Joshua was in charge. And the five kings came together against him. You'll find that in the 10th chapter. And in chapter 10, in verse 11, well, let's just turn over there and look at it. We've got that. Turn to Joshua chapter 10. This is, this is interesting. So it's not, it's not the first time that God has used hell to kill, to kill, to kill his enemies. It is really who it is. Good old Joshua. I'm going to turn him in. <clears throat> Anybody there yet? Yeah. You down there, Marie? No, I can't come. Uh, I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> I was a new Christian. I was sitting in the service that day. God, Pastor Lee Cox. I'm going to call you by name. I was sitting in the service. He preached. He got it. He said, turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Oh. I was burning my fingers up for it. <laughs> I finally went to the table of contents. And I thought, he's read the word of Michael wrong. <laughs> ah, and after you got that, he said, I've seen all of you looking, so I can tell who reads Bibles and who doesn't. <laughs> so, I remember that. All right, Joshua chapter ten, verse eleven. Here, let's start. Let's start. At, let's start at verse nine. Joshua therefore came upon them, these five kings and their armies. Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Chased them along the road that goes to Beth Haran and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel 
and were on the descent of Beth Aran, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Esther, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Don't tell me that God will kill you. He will kill his enemies, Charles. He's done it. He's done it. Now, now people, you don't like to hear that. God is love. God is merciful. God is gracious. He is. He is. If you're not his enemy. If you're not his enemy. When, that's why I thought Christ comes that we might be saved not be his enemies. These people we're reading about in Revelation here tonight, they have rejected Christ. They have rejected God. They're his enemies. And he's going to kill them. That, that's just what he's going to do. So <clears throat> that, that's just who he is. That's why I say if, if, if the gospel that people preach doesn't contain judgment, it's not a true gospel. Because that, that's who he is. That's what he does with, with the enemies. I'm not talking about today, but he still has that power. He's sovereign. He has that power. But that's why Christ came, that we are, we are in a dispensation of grace today. So if you're an enemy of God, and you're not dead, I would be getting on his side quick. That's just, that's just my, my duty to Christ. Joshua 10 and 11. Now, it says they blasphemed, they blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, since that plague was exceedingly great. We've seen that before. We've seen them blaspheme God before. What did we conclude? What did we say that that means when we read they blaspheme God? What, what did we say that meant they were doing? Blaspheme means taking God's doing. Right, Charles. Say, saying that which is good is really bad. That's what blasphemy is. So what are they doing in a sense <clears throat> when they blaspheme God? What did we say they they are actually doing? Turn your back on. Them. Well, they turn their back on. Them. But it's a fact that what God is doing. Do you believe God is righteous in what he's doing? Yeah. yeah, he's a righteous God. He's doing the right thing, is he not? But they're saying he's a mean God. He's a bad God. Because look how he's treating these people. What kind of a God would throw down 75 pound hailstones on the head of his people. What kind of God would split the earth wide open and suck up all the islands and all the mountains? What kind of God would do this kind of thing? It's the seventh seal. It's the seventh seal. Right. Well, he's destroyed it. Right. Judgment. Y'all got this thing. He's a righteous God. He's a righteous God, which means everything he does is right, whether we think it is or not. And these folk, remember I've said, and I know you haven't forgot, when, when judgment comes and punishment comes, two things, one of two things always happens. People either what? They learn from it or they get worse. These people are saying, what a bad God. What a bad God to do this thing that that's blasphemy. He is not a bad God. He's a good God. He's a good God. That's why he came. That's why Christ died. That's why he's given us the opportunities we have. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a forgiving God. But he is a just God. He is a righteous God. And what he's doing here. He has the right to do. He's sovereign. And he's given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And they rejected him and chose the false God. They chose the Antichrist. 
automatically they become enemies of the good God, the real God. He's not going to stand for that. He, he's not going to turn his head and say, well, they, they just... Jesus hung on the cross and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And that forgiveness is in place right now. But at the end of this tribulation, it's going to run out. It's, it's over. They had a chance. And they didn't go. Now, going back to Revelation <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 13, I said we'd hit that again. When the witnesses were raised, you can go back and you, you can look at that. But 7,000 were killed in the great earthquake that took place when the witnesses were raised in chapter 11. And it says in that chapter that <clears throat> the rest, the rest feared God and gave him glory. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, what do you think happened to those that feared God, got scared because 7,000 people died at the earthquake when the witnesses were resurrected? What do you think happened to those souls? They scooted, man. They didn't take no mark in peace. They gave God the glory. See, they didn't go the other way. They didn't blaspheme God. They said, man, we learned our lesson. This God's going to kill us. If we don't bow to him, he's going to wipe us out. And they bow to him. They'll be forgiven for that. They could, they'll go through that. So that's the two opposites of what you see in the earthquakes. But it says they blaspheme you because of the hell. Yeah, that would make you bad. Send you by and hell start beating. I mean, we get upset now when it beats our car hoods up. These things are going to turn out skyscrapers and kill cows. And it's going to set me fire. I don't know. It's going to spawn. I mean, it ain't going to be just sporadic one or two. Listen, you don't want to be in the earth during those days. Facebook guys, you don't want to be in the earth during those days. Any questions on, on, on that verse or any other than study? Any questions on it? There were more than one hailstorm. Oh, more trouble. Lots of It's going to be a bunch. Can't, can't, really, can't really imagine. Can't really imagine what that would be like. And, and no want to. But the last one sort of the says this plague was an exceedingly great. Exceedingly. Exceedingly. Above great. other plagues. <clears throat> Terrible. Terrible. Punishment. Wrath from an angry God. A good God, a sovereign God, a righteous God, and bad people. Savior of the world. Savior of the world. Now what's the day of salvation? Anybody else? Questions, comments on chapter 16. So we move through it. All right. Father, we thank you tonight for these who, who have come. Thank you for their input. I thank you that they help me as we study together, as you lead and guide and direct all of us. Thank you for our, our friends who join us on Facebook, those who tune in, those who we will look at it later. Father, it's hard for us to, to imagine you being a God that would do this. But, Lord, you came and, and you suffered. And you died on that cross that, that no one, no one will have to endure this. Everybody that, that has an opportunity to reach out to you, you'll save them. You'll, you'll, you'll save them. If they'll come to you, you'll save them. And now is the day of salvation. We don't, we don't want to take a chance on waiting. People shouldn't wait because this thing can happen at any time, at any time. So now I pray as we go from here, we remember these things. We know this is going to be a terrible time. We're thankful we're not in that time. But we're thankful that we're in the dispensation of grace. That we can look to you for salvation right now. So help us as disciples to be evangelists. That we might evangelize a lost world before it's too late. <clears throat> in your name, Jesus, we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Oh, look. Mike? Dr. Grant.
Nacional, creo. 